Welcome back to the Core EM Podcast. Core content for anyone, anywhere, and just in time. This is the official podcast of the NYU Bellevue EM Residency Program. This week, we're going to discuss some key points from a talk given by one of our PGY2 residents, Rich White, on seizure management. Rich focused his talk on two areas, the initial management of seizures and the ED workup of seizures. In particular, he wanted to focus on the first-time seizure patient. When a patient presents with a seizure, one of the first keys is to make sure that what you're dealing with was a seizure and not syncope. It can be difficult to tease these apart, as many of the things that we think are hallmarks in generalized seizures can be seen in syncope as well. Syncope patients can have some brief myoclonic jerking movements, they can have loss of bowel or bladder continence, or even bite their tongue. One useful thing in differentiating the two is looking for the presence or absence of a post-ictal state. You should see quick orientation and return of mental status in syncope, but patients with generalized seizures will almost universally experience a post-ictal period where they remain confused and altered. Because it's hard to tease these apart, I think many EPs will always obtain a 12-lead EKG in patients with seizures. And we're not just talking about the first-time seizure, but any time a patient comes in with a seizure. If it was syncope and not seizure, you may find a cause for the syncopal event and save a life. I'm always looking for things like the obvious AV blocks, tachydysrhythmias, and ischemia, but also for some subtle things like WPW, Brugada, QTC prolongation, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and arrhythmogenic RV dysplasia. Let's move from the seizure versus syncope issue to the management of the seizure in the ED. If the patient begins seizing in the ED, what are the first steps in management? We're going to begin by confirming airway patency, working to get an IV, and getting the patient on a monitor. Although we're going to supply anti-seizure medication, most seizures will stop either before they get the medication or before the medication has time to take effect. In spite of this, we're going to still give a medication, and the medication that we are typically reaching for is a benzodiazepine. The reason we're giving the medication, even though most seizures are self-limited, is that if you have a non-self-limited seizure, how long are you going to wait before you say, wow, maybe I should give a medication? So we're just going to go ahead and give them up front. Now, it's tough to get an IV in a patient who's seizing, and that can lead to a delay in medication delivery. So IM is probably the way to go unless the patient already has an IV in place. The most common medications that are used are lorazepam and midazolam. For midazolam, the dose is going to be 0.15 milligrams per kilogram IM, typically around 10 milligrams. Or you, again, you can use lorazepam somewhere around 0.03 to 0.06 milligrams per kilogram IM, which is typically a dose of about 2 to 4 milligrams. We put together a short table on benzodiazepines a couple months back, and I'll drop a link to that in the show notes. All right, so 10 milligrams of midazolam or 4 milligrams of lorazepam IM is going to be our first line. And the vast majority of cases will stop with this or will stop even without that medication. Once we've got the seizure activity stopped, we have to decide on continued workup. The differential diagnosis for seizures is pretty long, but we can group these into some categories to help organize our thoughts. Number one, vital sign abnormalities, in particular hypoxia, severe hypertension, and hypoglycemia, as well as hyperthermia. These can be easy to find in reverse, but sometimes easily forgotten, particularly hypoglycemia and hyperthermia. Number two, I think about infectious causes, meningitis and encephalitis, abscess or parasitic infections. Category three is toxic metabolic, things like hyponatremia, hypocalcemia, uremia, and medication overdoses, including TCAs, alcohol withdrawal, and INH. I also include pregnancy here, both prepartum eclampsia as well as postpartum eclampsia in the toxic metabolic, simply because it doesn't really fit anywhere else. Number four, I'm thinking about CNS abnormalities. This includes masses as well as intracranial hemorrhage, whether it be spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage or a traumatic epidural. And then finally, the fifth category is the primary seizure disorders. In a patient where you don't know the background, this is kind of a diagnosis of exclusion. We want to make sure that we go through all of the other causes, run through all of those in every seizure before we get to, oh, maybe this is just primary epilepsy. Now, if you run through that differential, if you run through those categories on every seizure, you're going to be unlikely to miss something major. So this is a really critical step in the way we think. 
If the patient has a diagnosis falling into one of those first four categories, that's the vital signs, CNS infections, toxic metabolic, or CNS lesions, they've had a provoked seizure, and we're going to find and treat that underlying cause. In the absence of one of these causes, you're dealing with an unprovoked seizure. In patients with known seizure disorders where you don't find one of those serious causes, we're going to think about checking the AED levels, their anti-epileptic drugs, if there are levels that we can get, and if we can get the history from the patient about what medications they're taking. We also want to find out if they're taking their medications regularly, since some of these AEDs we simply can't check levels. Another key piece of information is finding out from the patient how often they have seizures. Even when the patient's taking their medications regularly, when they're therapeutic, they can still have breakthrough seizures. It's not necessarily something to get too worked up about. If the patient returns to normal mental status, there's a non-focal neuro exam, and there's nothing concerning in your assessment, they can typically follow up with their neurologist to determine whether their AED needs to be titrated up or if they're going to leave it the same. What about the first-time seizure? We're going to go through the differential and make sure we don't see any of those particularly dangerous things. And again, that's the vital sign abnormalities, toxic metabolic issues, central nervous system infections, as well as central nervous system lesions. I typically will check an EKG as well as electrolytes, though I think it's pretty unlikely that a patient will have a seizure and return to baseline if they have a significant electrolyte issue. What about neuroimaging in these patients? Often a non-con head CT will be ordered, but it's unclear whether that's actually beneficial. If the patient has a non-focal neurologic exam and they've returned to their baseline mental status, it's highly unlikely that a non-con head CT will be helpful. A similar recommendation is given on starting anti-epileptic drugs, the AEDs. There's no good evidence that this is going to be beneficial. If the patient is truly at baseline with a non-focal neuro exam, imaging and starting an AED can be deferred to either the patient's primary doctor or when they follow up with a neurologist. Obviously, there are some exceptions to the above comments. If the patient's immunocompromised, HIV, AIDS, chronic steroids, or an immunomodulator, I'm going to get the CT, and I'm going to strongly consider an LP for infection as well, since that state, that immunocompromised state, can alter how they're going to present when they have a CNS infection. If the patient's on an anticoagulant, I'm definitely getting a non-con head CT to rule out a bleed, regardless of whether the patient returns to baseline or not. That covers the self-limited seizure, but what if your first-line medication fails and the patient continues to seize? If I give a good dose of benzodiazepine and the patient is still seizing, I'm going to start thinking about the possibility that the patient is in status epilepticus. Now, going into an in-depth discussion of status is a little bit beyond what we can cover in this particular podcast, so this is an issue that we're going to have to revisit in the future, but a couple of comments I think are important. First, let's define status epilepticus. The things that are going to make me think about status are if a seizure lasts more than five minutes, there are two seizures without a clearing of mental status in between, or if a patient was simply picked up by EMS for a seizure and they're still seizing on presentation to the ED. The reason we care about this is that status has a high mortality and morbidity, and the longer the seizure, the more likely there's a bad outcome. There are a number of algorithms out there for breaking status that employs a benzodiazepine along with a number of second and third line agents, including phenytoin, phosphenytoin, levetiracetam, or Keppra, valproic acid, etc. Personally, I don't buy this approach. I'll give two or maybe three hefty doses of benzodiazepine. If that doesn't work, I reach for propofol and protect the patient's airway. General anesthesia is almost always going to stop status, and we don't want that patient to seize any longer than they need to and fry more brain cells. Scott Weingart has a great podcast on this topic, and we'll drop a link to that in the show notes so you can get a little bit more of a deep dive. Now, again, we didn't go into a deep dive here, but we'll take this on at a later time on Core EM. All right, let's get to the take-home points for this podcast. Get a detailed history to tease out whether the patient had a seizure or a syncopal event. Regardless, it's reasonable to get an EKG, particularly on patients with first-time seizures, in case it was actually syncope. Benzodiazepines are first-line therapy for seizure termination. If you don't have IV access, go with 10 mg of midazolam or 2 to 4 mg of lorazepam IM. Always review the five main category for causes of seizures in order to make sure you're not missing anything. Those categories, once again, are vital sign abnormalities, CNS infections, toxic metabolic issues, CNS space-occupying lesions, including masses and bleeds, and finally, primary epilepsy.
In patients with a first-time seizure without a particular cause and return to baseline neurologic status, there's unlikely to be any benefit from a non-con head CT or to starting an anti-epileptic drug. Scheduling close follow-up with a neurologist is very reasonable. The key is to do a thorough examination and make sure the patient has really returned to their baseline and there isn't still some subtle abnormalities. And then finally, in status epilepticus, hit the patient with two to three hefty doses of benzo, and then if their seizure is still ongoing, consider moving quickly to propofol, general anesthesia, and intubation in order to rapidly control the seizure activity. Well, that's all for the Core EM podcast this week. Come on over and check out the site at coreem.net. We've got a ton of great core content emergency medicine. We'll have a core post up on Wednesday and a journal update up on Thursday. Don't forget to check out our Facebook page, follow us on Google+, and on Twitter where our handle is at core underscore EM. Thanks, and see you all next week.